Good evening. I'm Dr. Fred Rouse, the Real Money Doctor. And it's currently, oh, where are we at here today? Friday, the 12th of June. And it's just a few minutes before seven o'clock. And I wanted to touch base on the daily events that affect the way you get, protect, and enjoy your money, your life, and your retirement. The question for today is, still running on the first wave? I'll get to that in just a few minutes. For now, uh, we always start with the current number of COVID cases, just because that's the thing that's been affecting the economy and your life since at least March, some of you before then. Right now, the current number of COVID cases is over 2 million right now, 2,043,000 actually. Okay, um, That's 28,000 more than yesterday. Now, I don't know what happened uh, overnight. Don't know if there's a reporting thing or what. The day before it was 18, the day before that it was basically 18, 20 or so. Uh, for some reason, it's 28,000 uh, new cases as of yesterday. So I don't know what's going on with that. We'll have to take a peek at that and see if those numbers change over the weekend. The deaths right now are 114,000 deaths, 1,104,000. 1, 446 deaths so far. Okay. A lot of people have died. A lot of people have been saying from the beginning of this, it's a media hoax. It's nothing that's going to go away. It's one case, it's 15 cases. It'll go away in a month. It'll go away in two months. It hasn't gone away. People want to keep trying to compare this. Well, there's so many flu deaths every year. Well, this is 114,000 deaths, 114,000 of your fellow American citizens have died okay, from COVID-19 basically since March. It's a lot of number of people that have died. Okay. Um, right now, New York has got the highest number of, of cases reported, 381,000 cases. Uh, they picked up another 672 cases or so since yesterday. Um, their deaths right now are 3,000 or 30,649. 74 people have died in New York State over the weekend, or as of uh, yesterday, actually. New Jersey still has the second highest number of cases, right now at 166,000 cases. Um, that's another 348 since yesterday. Their number is coming down a little bit, which is nice. Their deaths in New Jersey since the beginning of this are 12,000. 489 that's 46 since yesterday they've made some dramatic improvements their numbers are coming down um that's in line with what they've been doing for the last week or so so their numbers are believable and that's good news for the state of new jersey and chances are they're going to be opening up more and more and we'll see what happens um a little bit of news here though california now moved up the number three spot was Illinois. However, California's got the number three spot right now. They're getting more cases. Again, as people reopen, you're going to see some more cases because people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not doing social distancing and not wearing masks. Uh, so California's got like, at the number three spot. Illinois is at number four. Massachusetts is at number five. Pennsylvania remains at number six. Texas is at seven. Florida, however, made some changes. Florida's now number eight. What a surprise. Okay. Uh, we'll get to that in just a couple minutes, too. Uh, Michigan is number nine, and the top 10 round out with Maryland. Now, the deaths in all the states, okay, on the coasts really have been decreasing, New Jersey and New York specifically. Um, they were hit the hardest, had the highest number of cases, still the highest number of cases, had the highest number of deaths, most likely. Also, I haven't looked at those in relation to everybody else, but their numbers are coming down. They've went out of their way. And if you were a resident of New Jersey or New York, you weren't happy with the way the shutdown happened. But it saved lives. And that's what the governor's there to do, to save lives, basically. Now, the number of cases are still rising, excuse me, uh, in strange parts of the country that you wouldn't expect normally. I touched base on a number of those cases or a number of states yesterday. Again, these are states that, you know, basically blew things off because they had a low population to begin with. 
Uh, they weren't anywhere near the coast. They weren't getting tons of travelers through them. And they felt safe. And a lot of these people felt it. You know, it's just the media. It's a big hoax. Well, their numbers are going up right now. Okay. And as all the states have reopened to some degree. Again, I mentioned seven of them yesterday that, that didn't actually close completely. Okay. But all the states are reopening to some degree. And there's still no treatment. There's still no chance for a vaccine that's going to be widespread use before the year is out. It's just not going to happen. Now, there is still news on the money front. And that's important stuff because it affects you on pretty much a daily basis. And the Dow made a, a bit of a comeback today. And you might not think that Dow affects you, but it does in, in some strange, perverse way. Chances are you've got money somewhere in a mutual fund, an IRA or 401k, something your own account. Very few people, my level of people, uh, zero six employees, uh, select individuals, people making basically under $500,000 a year or so. Okay. Those people don't routinely have individual stocks. Some of them have a couple shares here and there, but that's not the bulk of their investment. If they manage to save any money at all, most of their money is in some type of a mutual fund. And the mutual funds are individual companies and they're all respond to the stock market. They're all in the stock market. Now, the Dow made a little bit of a comeback today. Now, despite what the analysts say, okay, there's generally really no rhyme or reason to why the market does what the market does. These analysts are paid tons of dollars. You're talking multiple six figures, mid six figures, easy for a lot of these guys or gals. And you can get a dozen of them and they say one thing. And if you look around just a little bit, not really, really hard, just a little bit, you'll get another dozen who say the complete opposite. And it really makes it really difficult for, you know, people on my level to figure out what the hell's going on in the market? What am I supposed to do? And they try and research various stocks and you'll see tons of uh, things on TV, tons of commercials, um, trade stocks. It's easy. We give you all these tools and oh, cut me a break. Okay, um, those tools are useless to most people. There are just more lights and buttons there um, to get people to suck in, to buy more stocks, to trade more stocks. So the companies that are trading them make commission. They don't care whether they make money or not. They really don't care. Okay, they're in it for the commission. And their advertising, you know, is just to suck you in. So it's hard to... Diff to really research companies and find the good opportunities if they really exist at all. And these analysts are doing these things and they're looking for companies and looking for this and looking for the other. And if you've ever had a managed account, okay, you ever paid somebody to manage your account, you found that over time, sometimes not that long, that they ended up doing worse than the market did. That's not a surprise. You could pretty much throw darts at, at a dartboard and over a period of time do as well or better than most of these analysts. I mean, they get a, a stock here or a year here that they're really good. But for the most part, over time, okay, they don't do any better than the market does. Most of the time, they do a little bit worse. Now, it's really interesting. The Federal Reserve is been doing things this past week and Wednesday, Wednesday, I think they said they're going to hold the benchmark interest rates at near zero through 2022 to try and help the economy recover. And that's a nice thing. And, you know, we've been hit pretty hard and the central bankers along with that. Okay. Did a projection on Wednesday that the economy is going to shrink 6.5% in 2020. That's not particularly good news. Now with millions of people out of work, and a growing number of Americans feeling severely cash strapped, historical low borrowing rates means more loans and cheaper loans, if you can actually get them. Credit card rates are down to a four year low. I talked about that yesterday. However, the US is in a recession. But even if the US is in a recession, they call it a recession. They hate that word. They really hate using that word. Okay, but they call it a recession. 
and the stock market continued to go higher, except for the last three days. And then on, uh, when was it yesterday, Thursday, at a 1,400 point drop. Now, the banks are still being tight with their lending right now. They really don't know what's going on. And they're uncertain as to what's happening in the economy. And when they issue a loan, they end up selling a loan generally in a short order. Or, okay, if they hold a loan, they still have bank examiners that come in and review their loans. And they don't care who you are. It doesn't matter whether you're a nice guy or not. If their numbers don't match up, they get shit. So it's easier for them not to make loans. They make money making loans. Okay, they don't pay anything in interest rates, but they charge you, you know, two, three, four, five, eight percent or something on a loan, and they'll pay out, you know, a half a percent. But you know, they're real cautious at this point in time. At the same time, mortgage rates are substantially lower. But again, very few people can actually benefit from those rates. The average rate right now for a fixed rate is at a record low at 3.47%. Now, credit's tightening. Even if rates are at record lows, and it's really difficult because very few borrowers are really able to take advantage of those lower rates. The people who need it the most, this has always been the case. If you need the money, okay, you can't get the money. If you don't need the money, they're very willing to loan you the money. They hate risk. That's the overall thing. They really hate risk. So if you have no debt at all, okay, and $100,000 in a bank, you want to borrow $50,000, no problem. They don't care. You have no debt. Hundred thousand dollars in a bank already. You don't need the money. You're not asking for the money. But if your small mom and pop operation has been shut down for two or three weeks, or a month or more, okay, yeah, you need the money, and you're not sitting on a hundred thousand dollars, and the chances of you getting a loan are pretty close to zero. Now, the Fed has a a really indirect influence, almost no influence at all, on deposit rates. And it's how much the bank is actually going to pay you in interest for you to put your money in the bank. Well, for now, it's, you know, it's tied to the federal funds rate, which is basically zero. The, the rate that the banks charge each other overnight to borrow money is basically at zero at this point in time. And the Fed isn't about to change that. But that really hasn't done anything for the interest rates okay your savings account is still at 0.06% or less Mnuchin said the other day that he would seriously consider you know more direct payments to individuals in the next phase of the coronavirus uh, legislation well that's really great okay because he negotiates directly with people in the house in the congress uh, the president isn't doing that but Mnuchin is doing that he's done that before one of the other stimulus packages, but Mitch McConnell's in absolutely no rush to bring a fourth bill anywhere near the Senate just yet. His big thing is he wants to see what happens. Well, what happened is the cities and the states are running out of money. The mom and pops that wanted the money, that needed the money, didn't get it. And lo and behold, okay, this was the problem with the initial bill that was fought so hard for they wanted disclosure they wanted everybody to know who got the money what a surprise they're not letting people know who got a lot of that money still okay somebody's thumbing their nose at congress what a surprise now the question for today is are we still running on the first wave now to help curb the spread of coronavirus the U.S. basically shut down in the middle of March. They shut down retail stores. They shut down restaurants. Public spaces were closed to prevent gatherings of people. And everyone was pretty much asked to stay and shelter in place as much as possible. And if you went out, you wore a mask. Okay. Recently, businesses have reopened. And states have started to lift a lot of those restrictions. They've listed those lockdown orders. Texas reported over 2,500 new coronavirus cases just on Wednesday. Okay. The highest reported in a single day by far since the pandemic actually started. Now, the number of Texans that are currently admitted to hospitals for coronavirus climbed to a new record for the third straight day as a state which has the fastest 
most aggressive reopening timelines in the entire nation has seen a surge of infections in the last two weeks at Memorial Day. 2,500 cases. 2,500 cases have been reported by the Texas Department of Health. And Wednesday, it's 20, 28% higher than any other day since the pandemic actually began. Far surpassing the old record of 1,900 cases on May 31st. Now, according to the Texas Department of Health, there were 2,153 patients hospitalized with coronavirus on Wednesday. Hospitalized patients, surpassing the record set each of the past two days, as well as ahead of the old record of 188,000 cases, 1,888 cases that were recorded back on May 5. Okay, their numbers are going up big time. Now, the positive test rate, which official states have used as a key figure moving forward to reopening, has also gradually risen over the past two weeks. And remember, when they were doing all these things originally. Down in D.C., the president came on every day and Fauci and the rest of the, the, the board came on and telling you what was going on. And the president himself announced, oh, yeah, you should have a, a seven day declining number of cases before you start to reopen. The cases are picking up, folks. OK, the seven day average for tests coming back positive reached its highest rate since mid-April this past week and is now above six percent, a threshold that the public health officials said, said that they'd like to see things remain below. Texas entered phase three of its reopening last week. And its restaurants will be able to operate at basically 75% capacity starting Friday, starting today. The state continues its aggressive reopening while seeming to ignore the White House guidelines that says the states need to see a downward trend in either new cases or the infection rate to move uh, forward uh, with reopening. Okay, that has not happened. Now, Texas Governor Greg Abbott has said several times in the past that the state should expect to see an increase in, in infections as testing ramps up. Okay, but that's not going to explain what's happening in the rise in the hospitalizations. And we'll get to the increase in testing and what that really means in just a couple minutes. Okay. But it doesn't really affect the number of hospitalizations. Why are there increasing hospitalizations? Okay. Even despite the positive test, if you want to ignore the test, that's fine. But look at the number of hospital hospitalizations that are still happening. In terms of new infections, okay, is what he said. In part, they're attributed to activities surrounding Memorial Day, uh, such as gatherings where protective uh, behaviors have been sort of lax. Now, it's Rebecca Fisher. Fisher, She's an epidemiologist at Texas A&M uh, School of uh, Public Health. And she told the Texas Tribune, Tribune that. Texas is not, however, alone in seeing a jump in cases in the last few days. Now, over a dozen states across the U.S., including California, again, they've hit number two now. They were number two before. They hit number two this week. Okay. Have also had a concerning rise. Now, Abbott said in the past that if a state appeared to be going in the wrong direction, there might be some delays in reopenings. But that doesn't seem to be the case so far with the rise in hospitalization. A spokesman for the government told the State Tribune, um, it's a local Texas paper there, that this is far from a, a capacity crisis. Okay. They're saying, well, if every Texan who actually needs access to a hospital bed will have access to a hospital bed. Well, is that sort of missing the point here just a little bit? I'm glad if they need a bed, they're going to get one. Okay, we heard this line before. If you need a test, you can get a test. Okay, that didn't happen. Maybe they have enough beds. I don't know. But they do have an increase in hospitalizations. And they're pushing to reopen the state even more. Now, even with the seven-day average, okay, for new cases rising above 1,000, new cases reported, uh, you know, per day in late May, they're now over 1,500 right now. There were 1,000 in late May. Now they're over 1,500. Okay. The number of deaths from coronavirus in the state has been relatively stable since mid-May, staying about in the low mid-20s per day. 
However, the number you can't hide in any way, shape, or form is 42%. That's how much hospitalizations have increased in Texas since Memorial Day. 42% increase in hospitalizations. Now, Florida is also making the news. Okay, They moved up a spot. What a surprise. Their latest daily case count being the highest it's been since the outbreak began. It's, you know, nearly a 30% increase from Wednesday, which saw around 1,200 new infections. Thursday's daily case count also marks a nearly a 70% increase on the figure reported since the state's reopening on May 5, when 542 cases were actually recorded. Now, the Florida daily case count has surpassed 1,000 six times in the past seven days, according to data compiled by John Hopkins University. And that's been the gold standard of who's collecting data these days. Now, the state has a seven-day rolling average for daily cases has been increasing mostly since May 28. The Florida stay-at-home order, okay, expired on May 4 in Miami-Dade, okay, and the state's worst-hit county, Broward County, were the last regions to begin phase one of the reopening on May 18, okay? Bars, restaurants, retailers, gyms, personal care services, places of worship, event, entertainment venues, and beaches have all resumed operations. Now, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis noted that on a Tuesday press conference, that don't make the mistake, is what he said, of identifying more cases as thinking there are, there are more cases one day compared to day two or two months ago. Okay, if there's more cases, it's because we're doing more testing. Okay, I must be missing something on this, folks. Okay. Yes, you're doing more testing. You get more positive cases. Does that mean the cases didn't exist before? You just didn't know about them before. That's the problem. You weren't testing before. You didn't know they existed. Now that you've got the test, now, okay, you know they exist. What are you going to do about them now? You can't just blow it off and say, oh, we're testing more so we have more cases. No, you had more cases before. You just didn't know about it. Now, remember, most of the states are still underreporting their cases. And yes, if you test more, you're going to have more cases. The interesting thing is that, you know, you had them before. The testing just simply confirms that. It. It's like walking into a dark room. You turn the lights on and all of a sudden the roaches scatter. Didn't mean they weren't there before. You just didn't see them. Just because you don't have the cases, you didn't do the testing, doesn't mean you didn't have the cases. Now you're doing the testing, all these cases show up. They were still there before. You just weren't in the testing. You didn't know that they existed. Okay. That's sort of a problem. Okay, now I'm okay. I try not to get too political when I do these things. I try not to. Okay. Now not everyone would agree with that statement, but I do try. However, something came up today, and I just had to mention it. Okay. The president wants to do a rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma on June 19th. Now, not everyone knows. Okay. Um, because it's not well covered in the history books. It's not well covered at all in the history books. But I'll get that tell us in just a second. Outside of being exceptionally, exceptionally tacky and racist to begin with, since that day, June 19th, again, it's not covered in the history books, okay, that's the day that the U.S. dropped bombs and organize a mob of white people against a thriving black business community in the city of Tulsa in 1921. Research that a little bit. You want to be honest with yourself? Research that one a little bit. Tulsa, Oklahoma. The U.S. actually dropped bombs on that city in black neighborhoods. It was a thriving black neighborhood. They had a white mob, people going through the neighborhood, burning it down. 
Over 300 black people died that day. Now, outside of that, outside of that, it was tacky by itself. It's obviously clear that Trump really loves his people and is concerned with their well-being. So much so that if you register to go to this rally that he's going to have in Tulsa on June 19th, you register on his website to go to the rally. You have to sign a disclosure and disclaimer saying that if you should get COVID, you won't sue the president or the organizing committee or the venue or anyone associated with the campaign. Now, he really doesn't like masks. He doesn't want you to wear them to the rally at all. He doesn't wear one. He doesn't want to see anybody with him. Okay. Now, just imagine you go there. Okay. These are his people. He's really concerned he's going to be fighting for you. That's what the theory is. Okay. He's going to protect you from the borders, all those bad people coming over the borders. Okay. All those bad people trying to take your jobs that he ships overseas. That he goes, his own campaign stuff is made in China. What a surprise. Not made in the U.S. Okay. But he wants to jam pack a stadium or wherever they're going to hold it. And you need to sign a disclosure saying that you're not going to sue. Isn't it interesting because he said, this is all fake news. Okay. The whole thing is being hyped by the media. But you can't sue him for putting you in danger. Obviously, he's a, a true leader without a doubt in the world. So what's really all this really mean to you? As you can see, more and more states continue to open parts of their economy and getting a glimpse of what it looks like in a new, not quite yet, so COVID, COVID post-environment, not quite finished yet. The problems are many and they're not going away anytime soon. This is a new virus and people are still learning a lot of new things about it every day. And that's why from March until now, you've seen wear masks, don't wear masks. Um, you, you've seen tons of things and they're back and forth. Okay. As they learn more, you get more updated information. You go on Facebook and depending on what you feel like promoting, people are posting a lot of outdated information saying you shouldn't wear masks. You should wear masks. That's the current information. Okay. That's the current information. Now, the public thinking is that the second wave is really coming to these new states. Well, in reality, we're still in the first wave. We're still in the first wave of this. It's only those states haven't got their first wave yet. They're getting their first wave now. They weren't ready for it. They denied it before. This is not a second wave. The second wave will come sometime later in the fall. And that'll hit areas like New York, New Jersey, and the places that have already been really racked with COVID. Now, the national shutdown is just a matter of history at this point in time. Okay, um, Unless the current number of cases and the deaths more than double Okay. There's almost zero chance of seeing a, a national federal shutdown again. It's just not going to happen. The administration, as well as most of the country, really has no appetite for it at this point in time. And so it's really up to you, your governor, your local municipalities, to monitor what's going on and how to respond. It's difficult to do. It's almost impossible to do if you deny the problem actually exists at all. And you don't do an honest job of tracking and reporting the numbers. Now, the bottom line of all this is that you need to take care of yourself as much as possible. Okay. Keep your social distancing and wear a mask. If you have a properly fitting and you properly wear the N95 mask, you've got a certain level of protection against everybody else. However, the main reason for the mask and the mask that most people have is to protect others from you. Okay. Remember, all those new cases, they're finding them every day right now. Those people were already out and about walking around infecting other people and didn't know they had it until they got tested. Protect yourself. Okay. Be courteous. Wear a mask to protect other people. Okay. When you're driving, you stay in your lane, don't you? So you don't hurt somebody else. 
why is it such a bad thing to wear a mask? It's really no different. Now, I said in the beginning when I started this doing these shows back in March 20th, all of us will make it through this. And life will continue to go on. And it is. And most people have made it through. Okay, You're going to have more people dying. But most everybody's really going to get through this. And if you had a problem before this, you know, back in 2019, you're looking to retire at some point in time. Your money wasn't exactly right. You had a job that was doing okay. You could pay the bills. It was okay. But you didn't see much chance of retiring. But you'd keep on doing what you were doing. It would be okay. Well, the past five months have really focused a spotlight on those problems. If you were 50 plus then and looking to retire, okay, that just really intensified the problem because now you got five months past that, your money situation hasn't dramatically changed. Chances are you've been affected some way, shape, or form from COVID-19, either personally, situationally, or financially. Some way, shape, or form, COVID-19 has affected every life in the United States right now. I'm pretty much retired. Okay. I enjoy my quiet time. I don't get out of the house much. That's by my choice. Yet I've been affected. I can't do some of the things I would have do before. Now, if you tried to retire before, you're looking to retire this year, next year, three years from now, five years from now, and you were uncertain about your money then, you're more uncertain about it now. What you might be certain of is that, yeah, you're going to have to be working pretty much to the day you die. And if you talk to any financial planner, okay, they're very willing to sell you more mutual funds and annuities. They make a commission on those things. They enjoy those things. Is buying that mutual fund or annuity actually going to make any substantial difference in your long-term retirement? Probably not. Okay. If you're going to run out of money two years from now, buying that annuity means you're going to run out of money two years and a month from now. Not a big deal. Not a real big deal. Now, if you talk to friends and relatives, they know your situation. They might tell you that, you know, it's really too late for you. You're sort of stuck at this point in time. There's not much you can do. Just keep on working. Do the best you can. Save what you can. And you'll be working until the day you die. Well, that's what you hear a lot. And I'm here to tell you, if you're listening to me right now, that does not necessarily have to be your case. I'm here to tell you that you know, I put a program together. I help people retire next three to five years. It's not too late for you. It really is not too late for you. You can make a difference. Okay. You can make a difference when you do something a little bit outside of the box. Something that most financial planners don't even know about. Okay. Would tell you it's too risky. Okay. You have absolutely nothing to lose because right now, chances are, if you stay your current course, you're going to run out of money before you die. And most people understand that. Most people really fear that quite a bit. Or they have to cut back their lifestyle dramatically. And if you already put in 40, 50 years or so, that's not what you want to do. So again, I'm here to tell you, it's not really too late for you. It really isn't. I was talking to a woman just a couple hours ago. Um, I'll call her Joan. That's not her real name. I don't want to disclose her personal details. However, her husband is a counselor. And these people, they collect the problems of everyone. Okay. Being a counselor is no fun. They, it's like being a psychologist. If somebody's got problems, they're very, very willing to share their problems with you. And a counselor, they get paid to hear the problems. Well, they live in a small town. And they're jointly making less than $100,000 a year. Joan seemed like a really nice person. And she didn't really want much. She wants to replace her husband's income so that he doesn't have to do that counseling thing anymore. Okay, it's dragging him down. Okay, It's a second marriage for them. And when you get married a second time, you have a better feel for what you want, what you don't want. And most of the time, the second marriages work out pretty well. But 
with him being a counselor, he's not a happy camper most of the time. And so the second marriage is not as happy as either one of them would have liked it to have been. So if she can replace his income, get him out of the counseling, she'd be a happy camper. Now, they want to do that. They want to be able to see the grandkids. They're not asking to go tour the world. They're not asking to buy Lamborghinis. They want to lead a reasonable lifestyle. She seemed like a nice person. And after the call, I invited her into the program. I showed her how she can get control back in their lives. How they can get the cash flow that they'll need to retire in just three to five years and never have to worry about working again. She doesn't have to worry about counseling people again. Just three to five years. You know, I can't help everyone. But maybe, maybe I can help you. Go to my website, drrousenav.com. There's a 12-minute video there that explains the program. Okay, Watch the video. If you're interested, schedule a call. We can at least talk to see if I can actually help you or not. It doesn't cost you anything. You can't buy anything on the call. There's only one reason for the call. Only one. I want to see. Do you really have a need or not? If you do, can I actually help you or not? And third, do I think that, you know, after we get together, do I think we can actually work together or not? That's the only reason for the call. So go to drrousenow.com. Take a peek at the video. See what you think and let me know. I'd like to help if I can. But again, I'm retired. I can't help everybody. But that's a good start. See what you can do to take control of your life for you. Now, I'm Dr. Fred Rouse. I'm the real money doctor. Okay? My only goal is to help you get, protect, and enjoy your money, your life, and your retirement. And I appreciate spending some time with you tonight. Um, this is definitely a labor of love for me. It takes me four or five hours to get this show together. But I enjoy getting the worry out and helping as much as I can. Like and share the video. Okay, I'll be posting this on my YouTube channel, The Real Money Doctor, uh, tomorrow morning. And like and share it there. I look forward to spending some more time with you. And again, we'll get together on Monday, hopefully, around 7 o'clock. I hope to see you then. Thank you.